Thank you very much. So the man we've come here to celebrate likes beautiful women, vintage champagne and expensive cars. He's intelligent, suave, sexy, brave and ageless. That's enough about me. Let's talk about <laughs> James Bond. As if, <laughs> I wish. Uh, he made his first appearance 40 years ago, yet he doesn't look a day over 39. Tonight, we and the British Academy celebrate this extraordinary achievement. Over four decades, the Bond films have established a relationship with their worldwide audience that truly defines the movie maxim, give the audience what they want, but not in the way they expect. I admire your luck, Mr. Bond. James Bond. You expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Walter PPK. Vodka martini, shaken, not stirred. My name's Bond, James Bond. Double of seven, license to kill. I must be dreaming. My name is Bond. James Bond. James Bond. James Bond. James Bond was born in the novels of Ian Fleming, written in the 1950s, at the height of the Cold War. Fleming's character had been almost an alter ego. The author had worked in the Secret Service during the war. Now, precisely what he did, we don't know. Some of it's still classified. Although we do know that he never devised a plan to trap Hitler in a steam bath and turn the heat up. <laughs> Fleming's 007 was brooding, brutal and dark. Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman transformed him for the screen. He became cool, witty, charming, and yet still had that edge of danger. Millions of men around the world have hankered after the lifestyle, but only five ever been there, done that. From 1973 to 1985, that man was my first guest. He's the longest serving Bond yet. Welcome, please, Roger Moore. Looking good still, eh? Thank you. I, I, uh, that's very. Da I usually have a double go down the stairs, <laughs> Well, that's. I mean, that's a fact. I mean, you don't like explosions. You don't like heights. I mean, you were a fair pick for a James Bond, weren't you? I, I, I didn't even like the love scenes. You didn't. <laughs> Roger, is that the first lie you've told tonight? Every time I open my mouth, I'm lying. <laughs> what was it like following Sean? I cast a long shadow, Sean, didn't he, on the Bond character? Uh, yeah, but I, you, you know, four hundred actors play Hamlet, so. It, it, you know, I, all I was doing was going to be myself. And did you enjoy it from that point on? Yeah, I loved it. Was it the sort of happiest working time of your life, do you think? Well, I had a wonderful time because Cubby uh, and, and Harry were friends. We used to gamble together. And I think this was, this was their way of getting their money back. <laughs> 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 did they go along with your style, that lovely lights, comedic uh, style? I, I think the whole thing, you know, the, the, I al always played heroes because I'm... 
six foot one and a half. <laughs> and my nose is straight. And, and so I always got cast in these things, and, and, I, and I never really believed that I was a hero. Yes. And so I played everything tongue in cheek. Yes. And when I finally got bombed, uh, then my tongue got a little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and seven bonds later, then you finished. Did, did the old bones start to pack up? About three in, the bones had already <laughs> packed up. No, they started, they ran out of villains that looked old enough to be knocked down by me. <laughs> 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 the girls. Yes. I mean, it must be wonderful. I mean, every man's fantasy to be surrounded by all those wonderful leading ladies that you had. And they were just the leading ladies. What about the rest? And the men as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I swear. I swear to God, I am. <laughs> no, I, no, it was wonderful. I mean, they're, 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 they, were, they were all absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> And uh, it was difficult for them. They weren't quite as pretty as me, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's meet the two of the girls you work with, Octopussy and Holly Goodhead, better known, and perhaps fortunately, as Maud Adams and Lois Childs. So, um, I've been to bed with both of them. Have you? <laughs> More often with me. <laughs> I don't, I I don't ask you the obvious question, which was the best. I mean, that would be too ungentlemanly. But what about the sexual chemistry? Who could resist such a charming, very funny man? Well, if the truth shall be known, yes. it was uh, very dangerous. Why? Because... Uh, Kept me laughing all the time. I kept rolling out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> Louise, you, you did a scene with Roger. We mentioned they wasn't keen on heights. You did a scene with him on a wire in Moonraker, didn't you? What memories do you have of that? I didn't know he was afraid of heights. Actually, that's yeah. news to and me. Explosions. He, yeah. he put on a good. good he's, he's, he's a wimp, really. No. I look brave. I'm a good yes. actor. <laughs> <laughs> was, was it fun doing them? I mean, what, what are your lasting memories of them? The love scenes. <laughs> I'm just saying that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, well, Maud came back twice. Maud was Angie Andrews yes, with Priscilla Lee. twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lois, then, I mean, good memories. Also the love scene. Uh, because ours was in outer, sp it was in space, and we were on wires, and it was hysterical. It was really funny. Yeah, no? it was agony for me because you you were on your back, I was on top, <laughs> uh, which is normal. <laughs> uh, but the blood rushes to your head after you've been up there for a very long time, and you had this sort of thing pressing into your chest, which is that actually we couldn't do anything because we were separated by those things. That... <laughs> by a harness, and they had to keep. They had to try to get us together <laughs> manually. <laughs> It takes the, I wish I'd not had this conversation. It takes the edge off all of it now. I can <laughs> never believe another Bond love scene ever. But thank you to all for talking to us, to, to Roger, you. to Liz, thank and more. Thank, thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Over the first few years of 007, the producers perfected a secret formula for world box office domination. From a not-so-secret base at Pinewood, they launched James Bond into orbit. He came of age in 1964 with Goldfinger. That was the start. The Italians and Japanese called him Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. <laughs> Goldfinger became the most successful film to date. From the moment Goldfinger tried to give Sean Connery a laser vasectomy, the Bond films have always been at the cutting edge of technology, <laughs> keeping Bond up to date with lethal knickknacks, is a long-suffering, irascible, and bearing more than a passing resemblance to John Cleese. Wow. 
about Parkinson. Now, pay attention, please. Now, um, as you probably know better than anyone else, these uh, kind of tribute evenings are particularly lethal for four reasons. A, they go on much too long. <laughs> B, they're full of self-congratulatory show business waffling. <laughs> And uh, D, worst of all, the BBC get a lot of big names and then pay them b all. What, uh, what happened to C? C? C. C's over there with D and F and M and the rest of the alphabet. <laughs> so, in an effort to save us all from this dire fate, I've come up with a few bits of special kit for you, OK? Now, at your age, you'll probably find it harder and harder remembering things, correct? So that's why I knocked up this clever little fella uh, a few years back. You see, a mirror array attached to the camera allowed you to just read the words without even having to understand them, OK? <laughs> and uh, then you can pretend to recognize the guests when you have the foggiest idea who they are. Should uh, save lots of time. Incidentally, it was going to be called the auto prompt, but M finally settled on auto cue. Yes, I was, I was rather touched. Of course, um, that doesn't help the guest who won't stop waffling. And since it's just a standing up do, the old ejector seat won't work. So I've uh, developed this variant of the heat seeking missile. Okay? Now, this is a waffling seeking missile. Okay? <laughs> just uh, put your finger on the trigger there. Have Thank a go. You. And uh, voila, the lovey will be instantly dealt with. <laughs> um, next, I'm going to show you some clips. Now, when it comes to 007, there are two areas that we have trouble with. Uh, firstly, cars, or in the case of 007, let's call them wheels, since that's about all that's usually left of them afterward. You'll be using this Aston Martin DB5 with modifications. <laughs> Sign here, Mr. Bond. <clears throat> it's the insurance damage waiver for your beautiful new car. Will you need collision coverage? Yes. Fire? Probably. Property destruction? Definitely. <laughs> Takes care of the normal wear and tear. Do I need any other protection? Only from B007, unless you bring that car back in pristine order. A little nod there to our dear departed, much loved predecessor. And uh, incidentally, what we always say is if you must drive like this, at least do it abroad. <laughs> They, they don't notice so much there. In fact, in parts of Italy, it looks quite restrained. <laughs> um, secondly, you may have noticed that no matter how much expensive hardware we give w somehow he always manages to get himself caught. So the very clever Messrs. Broccoli and Saltzman devised a brilliant formula whereby we always give Bond one gadget small enough for him to forget all about until the last possible moment. Remember, if it hadn't been for Q Branch, you'd have been dead long ago. <laughs>
Finally, I'd just like to say on a personal note how deeply thrilled and proud I am to be connected to this great British institution, to be part of this wonderful, <laughs> multi-talented, warm-hearted, deeply fantastic... <laughs> ah! Ah! Every interviewer should have one. <laughs> uh, thanks to John Cleese. It's easy to forget that 007 is, when all said and done, a civil servant. The authentically bureaucratic side of MI6 can be seen from the fact that he has a license to kill. How much more British could you get than only shooting people once the paperwork is in order? <laughs> now, helping Bond negotiate the minefield marked with red tape is the irreplaceable Miss Moneypenny. Welcome, please, Samantha Bond. <laughs> the staff at MI6 have had to put up with a lot from 007. He's insubordinate, late for briefings, and frequently caught on camera in compromising positions. Though his colleagues spend most of their time telling him off, at heart they have a great affection for Bond. Well, one of them in particular. If only he'd recognized her qualities, he could have settled down years ago. <laughs> After all, Moneypenny has pursued James for so long, she can remember when he used to wear hats. This isn't a personal vendetta, 007. It's an assignment like any other. But if you can't treat it as such coldly and objectively, 008 can replace him. I just loved Brandley. Uh, and I was mesmerized by that whole, that whole uh, relationship between the two of them. I have a little more of this uh, rather disappointing, Brandley. Well, what's the matter with it? I'd say it was a 30-year-old fiend indifferently blended, sir. You have a job to do. I expect you're on a plane this afternoon. I haven't finished here, sir. Leave it to the Americans. It's their mess. Let them clear it up. Sir, they're not going to do anything. Look, I owe it to Leiter. He's put his life on the line for me many times. Oh, spare me this sentimental rubbish. 007 is here, sir. We'll see you in a minute. Money, Penny. What gives? Me. Give an ounce of encouragement. Miss Moneypenny is a, is a fantasy, just the way James Bond is a fantasy. Um, she was. I mean, I tried to portray her as a, a, an ordinary, nice, intelligent woman, and I think that's the way she came across. I think she portrayed um, loyalty and affection, and, and people appreciated that after seeing all the other Bond girls. Hi, Bond doing? I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. <laughs> I think there must be quite a lot of resentment in the fact that his, his, boss, his boss is a woman. Now. Seems your hunch was right, 007. It's too bad the evil queen of numbers wouldn't let you play it. You were saying? No, no, I was just, uh, just, uh... Good. Because if I want sarcasm, Mr. Tanner, I'll talk to my children. Thank you very much. <laughs> you go tonight, the first one I did. I got to be, strip, absolutely, tear him off a strip. Thrilling. Thrilling. If you think for one moment I don't have the balls to send a man out to die, your instincts are dead wrong. I have no compunction about sending you to your death. But I won't do it on a whim, even with your cavalier attitude towards life. The whole MI5 and MI6 thing, I think it's fascinating. I think it's an essentially kind of British institution, and so is Bond. I doubt if she'll remember me. Remind her. Then pump her for information. You'll just have to decide how much pumping is needed, James. 
I'm very fond of Smurf and Bond, and I am delighted that she's playing Money Penny. You know, this sort of behavior could qualify as sexual harassment. Really? What's the penalty for that? Someday you have to make good on your innuendos. Now, ask someone to name you a James Bond theme song, the chances are they'll come up with one sung by our next guest. Take an Ian Fleming title, John Barry's music, Don Black's lyrics, sung by who else but Dame Shirley Bassey. <laughs> Good stuff, huh? Movies are about moments. The Bond films have had their fair share, many of which feature unforgettably beautiful women.
let's let's now meet the Bond woman who set the style and the standard for all the others. Welcome, please, Ursula Andres. <laughs> Did you imagine, you can't have imagined, when you did that shot, you walked out of the seaway in that wonderful bikini, did you imagine it would be this lasting image, this everlasting, iconic figure of the Bond movies? No, I think I was really very lucky that the public was ready for a new image of a woman, athletic, uh, sportive, independent. Attractive. Well, that, that helped You're beautiful. a little bit. <laughs> you. a great figure. All <laughs> those things. No, but it, I think because I was, um, uh, you know, let's say, working on this beach, I uh, was not using my body to seduce. I was using my body to dive, get the shell. <laughs> well, <I'm sorry>. well, <laughs> it was a celebration of womanhood. It did me an awful lot of good, I tell you, when I saw you. It was marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the, but the thing is, I mean, does it does it haunt you in a sense, or are you pleased that it's that? It's uh, it's flattering that 40 years yeah. later yeah. they're still talking about this opening of when I'm when I'm coming out of the sea and I went to see the film after a year I d I finished it and everybody said to you so you have to go and see that you hadn't seen it no I haven't seen it so. I was in America and everybody came back from England. They said, also, when you come out of the sea, you have to see that. So I went to see the film. I waited and I waited and I waited. And I think, oh, so I must have made some special effects. You know, with rays and I don't know what. And I waited and I waited. And the film was over and I never understood it. Were you at the wrong film? <laughs> <laughs> you can't miss that moment. Yeah, sure. but the thing is, I, you know, because I just played myself. You did. I did. Of course, I know what you're saying. In, in the new film, of course, the new Bond film, Halle Berry plays tri tribute to you, or pays tribute to you, by doing the, exactly the same scene. And it's, it's very, very effective. I just talked to Halle, and she told me about it, and I'm, I'm very honoured that she represented my bikini in such a beautiful way. I'm going to go and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's now talk about working with, with Sean Con Connery, because, uh, he, as I said to Roger, he cast a long shadow as as Bond, his original one. What was he like to work with? He was sexy? Lovely. Was he? Lovely. Really? <laughs> no, he's my Bond. He's my Bond and he's still my Bond today and he's still my good friend. And it's very rare to say in this business when people have such a success that a man like Sean, the way I met him the first day in Kingston in Jamaica, he stayed the same person today. We stayed friends through all those years. That's good. He's the same person. That's good. But well, Ursula Andres, thank you very, very much indeed. Ursula Andres. Thank you. Thank you. So speaking, speaking of Sean Connery, Harry Saltman was who described him as being like a big jungle cat. Connery captured the audience's imagination and created an unforgettable character. He wanted to be with us tonight, but he's in the thick of a hectic filming schedule and he's unable to join us. But here are some recorded thoughts from the man himself and one or two others. I think that, that Sean, above all the Bonds, he, he looks to me like he could possibly kill you. Sean Connery <laughs> stands out because he was such a strong character I think you know you believed him that if he if he did get into trouble he could handle it keep a real sense of reality about the threat of it all, the sexuality, the jokes, and the physicality, you know, when you're dealing out uh, whatever it was. 
I think he's got the point. I think that the, the most important element in the whole Bond series was, apart from Fleming himself, who'd you know, written the original stuff and everything, I think it was Terence Young. I think he was the greatest influence. Terence had really identified very much with being the Grand Seigneur, the elegant backgammon, tumbling at her. I mean, he took me on the trip to get our clothes and everything, and it was an eye-opener. The budget on the clothes was astronomical in relation to the film, but he was right, Terence, because there was a look about it. It was coming in the wake of the kind of kitchen sink drama, so you wanted to have something that was still um, backgammon and uh, demand de fer and good food and beautiful girls. You're one of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. Thank you, but I think my mouth is too big. No, it's the right size. For me, that is. Sean is, was, is the sexiest thing on two legs, I think. Sean has, a, has the X factor. Well, I, I suppose my silence could have a price. Do you mean Bond? Oh, yeah. The women in Bond's world have always possessed glamour, confidence and independence. To guide us through this ever-changing and exotic world, let's meet the actress who played Bond's girl in The Living Daylights. Welcome, please, Mariam Darbo. if you're a Bond woman. Well, Bond's world has been graced by such a dazzling array of women, you would think it impossible to define his taste. However, it is possible to distill the essence of a Bond woman. Firstly, if you have an exotic name, it'll stand you in good stead. If your birth certificate says Christmas, Holly Goodhead, Electra, Plenty O'Toole, Honey or Jinx, it's an advantage. And though there's the odd exception to the rule, the women that really interest Bond are feisty, strong-willed, and self-reliant. They know what they want, and they go out and get it. Stand back, girls. <laughs> Playing a Bond woman, I, I don't think I realized it when I entered into the, the filming or the character that I was going to become a member of a sorority for life and, and a sorority filled with really um, extraordinary women. I have no country. I have no price on my head. I don't have to apologize to you, a paid assassin, for what I am. To my weight, James. To this day, everywhere I go, people say, oh, yes, you're a Bond girl. You're quite a girl, Pussy. I'm strictly the outdoor type. I'd like to think you're uh, not in all of this, uh, caper. Skip it. I'm not interested. Pussy Galore was a, a super character to play. It wouldn't matter what kind of film it was. And she wasn't a bimbo like so many were. And uh, she had her own air force. She was a great character. You've asked for this. I, I, I was always teased by Roger Moore. He used to call me Baby Bernhardt because I thought it was an acting role, and I never really understood that Bond was supposed to be a, you know, a glorious, glamorous, sexy woman who showed up in different costumes. I thought it was a, a major acting role, and I took it very seriously. <laughs> it is a blasphemy. They tell nothing to those who cannot see. Naomi is a, a very feisty lady. Um, I loved playing her. She did have quite a small wardrobe. Yes, it wasn't one of the largest um, I'd ever seen. For me, it was all about being a very a liberated woman, very strong. And when I approached the character, I was like, ah, she doesn't need James. She's, she's like a 
of her own woman. Look, pal, I was an army pilot. I have flown to the toughest hellholes of South America, and I will not have you lecture me about professionalism. Mr. Bond. And Miss Swift, Space and Technology magazine. Really? I take it Mr. Bond's been explaining his Big Bang theory. Oh, yeah, I think I got the thrust of it. I think the women today, certainly today, are, are, are even stronger than, than when we were starting. You know, we, we were in, we were, what, 25 years ago. Um, and our women, I thought, had become very strong. Having said that, way before, well, a little bit before, you had honor. I mean, who could be stronger than that? She was an extraordinary Bond uh, lady. Get up. No, 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 there wasn't any chance of my ever being chained to the kitchen sink. Not in life and not in movies. A free-thinking spirit and outstanding beauty are things most women would like to possess. But a Bond woman has one thing that all other women covet. She may play hard to get for up to an hour and 50 minutes, but ultimately, she can't resist him. <laughs> of course, I forgot your ego, Mr. Bond. James Bond, the one who has to make love to a woman, and she starts to hear heavenly choir singing. She repents and immediately returns to the side of right and virtue. But not this one. I'm beginning to like you, Mr. Bond. Or your eyes only, darling. <laughs> Double us. Triple X. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British end up, sir. <laughs> the year is 1987 and a new bond. In the living daylight, some license to kill, Cubby Broccoli wanted to reconnect with some of the original facets of Bond as written by Ian Fleming. The man he chose to embody that change. Welcome, please, Timothy Dalton. <laughs> So they want to change? They want to change. So how do you give it to them? Well, the Bond movies are fantasies, but I think in order to enjoy the fantasy, you've got to hold into the reality. And I am, was very, very influenced as a young kid by the movies of Sean Connery, by mm. Dr. No and From Russia with Love and Goldfinger. And so I wanted to bring, or at least uh, be able to contribute a sense of reality sense of involvement, a sense of excitement, hopefully some danger and possibly some risk. Uh, how tough is it, though, to, to project that in a, in a, in a film that's... Well, you, you might be overwhelmed by the technology and all that sort of stuff. You have to fight oh. hard for your corner, don't you, in a sense? You do have to fight hard <laughs> for your corner. And although Cubby did want to, 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 to bring the movies back to something more akin to the original, it was by no means a unanimous or an overwhelming decision. Was Every it not? No, no, no. Everybody has their opinions about a bond. Yes, movie. that's true. You cannot escape anyone working for the movies, in the movies, or in the street who yes. doesn't know what they want out of bond. Yes. But everyone is committed. It's a wonderful group of people. Really? And really? we got on with it and perhaps put in place some some building blocks for a change in the direction of the series. W was it, uh, from your point of view, I mean, apart from obviously it was, it was good for your career, but was it a happy experience? I mean, did you enjoy, did you relish going to work and being James Bond? It's not a movie that illuminates the social condition. <laughs> you mean it's not a look? <laughs> but, um, and it's very long days, but it's a great bunch of people. I had yeah. fabulous times. I've got a, a lot of friends from those days. It's been terrific for me. I enjoyed it. Do you miss it? I can't possibly miss it because it's part of my life. Of it's in my blood, it's in my heart, it's part of me. You, you, you go on to do other things, but yes. no, yes. you never leave it behind. Yes. Timothy Dalton, thank you very much indeed. Timothy Dalton. Thank you. Thank you.
are a team effort and for 40 years Bond has been providing a showcase of British talent in all areas of filmmaking. It's uh, for this achievement that BAFTA earlier this year awarded the makers of Bond Aeon Productions with a special award. Uh, 007 has always gone into action with the best, whether they be designers, cameramen, directors, whatever, no expense spared. The look of Bond's world has always been spectacular. Sit down. I think the villains in certainly some of the Bond films I had uh, designed were almost as important as Bond himself. Uh, I tried to reflect their power or their character, and I think the set helped them to portray that character. Good evening, Mr. Bond. Ken is very meticulous in um, everything he does, um, colors, finishes especially, and um, it was good. He was my mentor in those early days. It's going down into the volcano. I made a sketch and Cubby asked me how much it would cost, and I had no idea. I said, Cubby, you know, I don't know. He said, well, if I give you a million dollars, can you do it? And I bet for a million dollars, yes. And remember, a million dollars in uh, 66 was a fortune. Since the set was so enormous and so big, 120 foot high, with a 70 foot diameter sliding lake, it became a structural uh, problem. It was fantastic how the crew at Pinewood and my whole team uh, took up the challenge and we were literally working day and night on that set. The, the thing is, whatever money you spend, if you can see it on the screen, then it's been well worthwhile. But if you don't see it, then it's a waste of money. I would have never attempted some of these very imaginary designs or ambitious design if I hadn't known that I had the correct backup. We came to Spy Who Loved Me. Um, I became his art director then, and uh, obviously we had the ship um, with that huge exotic set inside. Apparently there was a quote by Sir Norman Foster, the Canary Row station, he based in part on the set of uh, uh, The Spy Who Loved Me. And uh, I think Ken would agree with me that uh, if, if and when I ever do second best, that's when I give up. Cubby Broccoli said that every time Ken puts pencil to paper, my heart stops beating. <laughs> the first ever Bond film took its title not from its hero, but its villain. Ian Fleming originally asked his friend and neighbour, Noel Coward, play the part of Dr. No, to which Coward is said to have replied, no, no, no. Very, very droll. <laughs> Joseph Wiseman got the job. He said at the time, I thought it might be just another B-grade Charlie Chan film. Good actor, Mr. Wiseman, but a terrible tipster. However, he did set the standard for Bond villains. Joining us now is a man who played, not only played a Bond villain, but is currently a bad guy in both Star Wars and The Lord of the Rings. And with him, is the very latest incarnation of evil to cross swords, literally, with 007 as Gustav Graves in Die Another Day. Welcome, please, Christopher Lee and Toby Stevens. Good evening, various Mr. Bonds, ladies and gentlemen. It has now reached that point in the show where we explain to you our evil plan. <laughs> James Bond 007 has proved a worthy, slippery, and persistently useful opponent. He's a constant thorn in the side of anyone with 
plans for world domination. <laughs> I should know. Hobbits and Jedi are bad enough, but neither of them have caused so much bother to the villain as Bob. A worthy opponent is 007's equal. Intelligence, ambition, taste in interior furnishings and women, an appreciation of the good things in life, all combined with, shall we say, a touch of evil. Man has climbed Mount Everest, gone to the bottom of the ocean. He has fired rockets at the moon, split the atom, achieved miracles in every field of human endeavor, except crime. <laughs> the West is decadent and divided. It has no stomach to risk our atomic reprisals. The firing power inside my crater is enough to annihilate a small army. When you remove Mr. Bond's heart, there should just be enough time for him to watch it stop beating. You let him get the better of you. The distance between insanity and genius is measured only by success. Spectre, special executive for counterintelligence, terrorism, revenge, extortion. I'm not interested in extortion. I intend to change the face of history. I feel I know you, although I never thought we should ever really meet. You have no idea how much Icarus is about to change your world. His government's given you a bomb. I prefer to call it an atomic device. It's small, but particularly dirty. You'll be very useful in helping to convince the authorities that I mean what I say, and I'll do what I claim. Intuitive improvisation is the secret of genius. Back from the dead. To us, Mr. Bond, we are the best. I think I see the answer. I shall look forward personally to exterminating you, Mr. Bond. Look after Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. Goodbye, Mr. Bond. Farewell, Mr. Bond. Goodbye, Mr. Bond. That word has, I must admit, a welcome ring of permanency about it. So now you understand a little about the character of the Bond villain. Here are some wise words from two other fine actors on bringing these characters to life. For thousands of years, Hindu pilgrims have journeyed to this holy place to witness the wonder of the miracle of the natural flames that never die and to test their devotion to God by holding the scalding rocks in their hands. The, but the villains have to be larger than life. It's all larger than life. You can't play it um, like Hamlet. You've got, to, you've got to find the thing that makes this person different and pump that up slightly. I see, you're right. You're right, he should be punished. David, hold this for me. My name is Dr. Kaufman. I am an outstanding digital marksman. Take my word for it, yeah? It's like, you know, two, two peers speaking and saying, well, you know, I'm going to have to torture you if you don't tell me. You, you understand we are basically in the same business. We are on different sides of the, of the law, but we're basically in the same business. It won't look like a suicide if you shoot me from over there. I am a professor of forensic medicine. Believe me, Mr. Bond, I could shoot you from Stuttgart and still create the proper effect. I think very, very different, of course, um, the, 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 the kind of double villain thing as well with Electra and Bernard. Um, Sophie Marceau being the first female villain in the films. I've always had a power over men. And when he's confronted with this, this woman, you know, is this, is this going to be his nemesis? Is he such a dinosaur? Is he so past it that it's actually going to be a woman in the end who, who, who does him? I'm going to redraw the map. And when I'm through, the whole world will know my name, my grandfather's name, the glory of my people. the choice for a villain, I'll tell you. <laughs> no villain will be complete without his sidekick. And here with me now is one of the most famous of them all, minus his metal teeth, I'm glad to say, Richard Keel. Good evening. I'm Richard Keel, and I'm pleased to be here tonight to speak up for the henchmen, many of whom never spoke up for themselves. 
Indeed, many of whom never spoke at all. <laughs> That's because action speaks louder than words. Henchmen are scene stealers, and their tragic comic roles have produced some of the most memorable scenes in the movies. You can see from the history how popular they were. They started off with names like Odd Job, Tee Hee, and Nick Knack. But by 1977, my character was named after a movie star. <laughs> so what makes a good henchman? Well, for a start, you need a good way to get rid of people. In my case, the secret was dentistry. <laughs> but it could be anything. It could be uh, a bowler hat, a metal hand, or just really strong thighs. <laughs> we also mustn't forget our non-human friends in the world of Deadly Dispatch. Alligators, snakes, spiders, they're all among the villain's most strongest allies. Oh, and one white Persian cat. For me, this is all the world. There's beauty, there's ugliness, and there's death. <laughs> When Bond started in 1962, cinema audiences weren't used to heroes who, having electrocuted the villain in a tin bath, declared shocking, positively shocking. <laughs> but it soon became standard. And nowadays, all action heroes offer quips between explosions. But what of the explosions themselves? For 007, everything has to be bigger and louder. To tell us about Bond's groundbreaking stunt work is a young British actress whose Bond experience has transformed her from English rose to master swordsman in the latest Bond movie. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome please, Rosamund Pike. the computer-generated image. I think we tend to go to the cinema and see a stunt and think, well, I bet that wasn't real. Well, in the world of 007, there isn't a great deal of virtual reality. Boats fly, cars swim, and um, when in Die Another Day you see me 
falling through a glass floor. That isn't computer trickery either. It, um, it really is my stunt double falling through a glass floor. <laughs> right from the start, Bond films have, have broken new ground and new cars, new buildings, new conservatives, well, anything really that happened to get in the way. The five actors who've played James Bond have always been ready to throw themselves into action, but perhaps the real stars of the stunt sequences are the brave stuntmen and women who throw themselves into the line of fire to make the rest of us look invincible. You're not thinking that. I sure am, boy. Next time, I'll take the elevator. We take it for granted today, really, that our movie experiences take us right into the heart of the action. But before Bond came along, things were a little different. <laughs> When Peter Hunt uh, started editing on Dr. No and uh, several, you know, quite a number of other films afterwards, uh, he and Terence Young developed quite a unique style of editing. It was, uh, you can only really liken it to a strip cartoon, really. <laughs> well, that sort of technique was really unheard of until that point. <laughs> so new and it was so daring um, and the public just loved it you know you got to the action you cut out all the boring bits <laughs> The most controversial choice to play James Bond was my next guest. He took over for the first time from Sean Connery. And if that wasn't tough enough, he wasn't an actor but a model. Nonetheless, the film he made on Her Majesty's Secret Service is celebrated by some as one of the best Bond films. Welcome, please, George Lazenby. <laughs> So, 
I said, you weren't an actor, you're a model, so how do you get the part? Same way as I got the modeling job. <laughs> <laughs> so did you want it? I mean, do you actually? Oh, absolutely. I was a Bond fan. Yeah? yeah. And so how did it come about? Uh, well, do you want my version or <laughs> everyone else? Because uh, since I got the job, I hear other people tell me how well, I got it. Well, tell, and it us, wasn't well, tell us what exactly happened. I took out an agent because a friend of mine wanted to be an actor, and uh, he double dated. Her name was Maggie Abbott. She worked for CMA, and, and she found that uh, I was arrogant enough and strong enough to <laughs> go up for the role of James Bond, and she sent me along for the part uh, without an interview yeah. because uh, we tried that, but not being an actor, they weren't interested, and Cubby used to call me a clothes peg when he found out I was a, <laughs> a model. And, uh, it was against the idea until uh, we went out to Harry Salzman's house and did about six or eight action scenes. And he said, well, the guy's got capabilities. If we can get rid of his Australian accent and that swagger he walks with, <laughs> then uh, we'll give him a chance. So, but it was tough, wasn't it? Because, I mean, you weren't, as I said, we weren't a, an actor, you're a model. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the some darker Bond novels as well. I mean, you get married in it, your wife gets killed. It's very personally dramatic. So did you find that, that tough? Yeah, I did. I mean, there were moments then when I thought, geez, I must look like a, a jerk here because I'd like to be a much more serious actor, you know, because they did call for some emotional scenes, which uh, I found that I read, when I read the book, I was emotional. Like, with yeah. the dying scene at the end, yes. I got a little tear in my eye, and uh, I thought, well, I'll just stick this book under the car dashboard here, and I'll read the last scene just before I do that, the, the scene in the book, and I did, and the tears came, and... And Peter Hunt said, do it again. James Bond doesn't cry. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, he said, do it without Great the tears. It's actually a moment. Yeah. And of course, too, I mean, the other, the other tough one that you got, the tough call, was to follow Sean. Well, that goes without saying. Oh. I mean, he was my hero. I mean, I thought, I can remember laying back in my bathtub one night after missing out with a girl because I took her to the Bond movie and she fell in love with him. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thinking, I wouldn't mind being that guy one day. <laughs> and then... Next thing you know. The dream came true. Yeah. <laughs> George Lazenby, thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much. George Lazenby. <laughs>
it's the start of Goldfinger, or it's the start of You Only Live Twice, or it's All the Time in the World, or it's On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Well, I knew um, Thunderball was going to be a special song because of the people who wrote it. You know, John Barry and, uh, and Don Black. Even before I heard the song, I knew it was going to be special. The next best part, which is like what is going to happen in the song, in the titles, you know, all the amazing stuff that Morris Binder started and now Danny Kleinman's doing, just building amazing visuals, you know, and all the iconography of Bond and the Bond films, and, and it kind of sets the tone for where the film's going to go as well. They were like the visual overture to the movie, if you like. They just set the whole tone, sense of fun and enjoyment. They were pictorially very wild and strange pieces. They could, they could go anywhere with it. They didn't, they didn't have any limitations on them. Much has changed over the last 40 years. After all, when James Bond first appeared, the world was on the edge of war and the Conservative Party was in deep trouble. That's progress for you. <laughs> Die Another Day is the 20th Bond in the 40th anniversary year. And while being undeniably a film for the new millennium, it does not affectionately to what has gone before, as you've already seen in the case of our next guest, the girl who rises from the sea in Die Another Day. Welcome, please, Halle Berry. <laughs> Did you hesitate when you were offered this, this job? Did you have to think twice about it? Um, I was just extremely flattered. In my career, I very rarely get offered a really good part. <laughs> <laughs> I usually have to fight for them and beg somebody and convince somebody that I should play it. So I was just extremely flattered that I was thought of. Had you been a, a Bond fan before that? I mean, had you looked at the films and said, I wouldn't mind playing in that movie? Oh, yeah. I've, I've thought that many times. You'd had those secret ambitions, had you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it would be great to snuggle up next to Pierce Brosnan or Sean Connery or any one of the guys. What, yeah. was, it, what was it like snuggling up to Pierce Brosnan? Go on, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was the hardest thing I ever had to do. I bet it was too. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I heard, yeah. <laughs> this character... <laughs> This guy to jinx. I mean, there's this great tradition going right way back from, you know, Ursula, as you said, coming out of the sea there to, to you now doing exactly the same thing uh, 40, years, uh, 40 years on. Did it set you a problem? I mean, did you look at any of the other Bond girls and think, well, what do I do? Do I make it different or, or what? Oh, sure. Well, it's pretty daunting when you look at that tape of Ursula mm, emerging from the sea. Yes. And I thought, wow, why me? <laughs> why is this the year I get to be in the movie and have to recreate a scene that's really a part of, you know, cinematic history. So I, I watched her more times than I, than I care to tell you right Did you? Yeah. 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 It's you good. had to get it right walking in that bikini. Oh, you got it right. Oh, I did. Yeah. Oh, oh thank without that. No. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. You know how she got it right. <laughs> what, about the, what about the actual uh, making of the film itself? Because they are very physical movies. I mean, do you have to go into training? Do you have to learn how to do karate or whatever? Um, no, no karate. But I did learn how to throw a knife or two and shoot a gun and... If I only had learned to run better, I guess it would have gone a little bit better. How did you do good at running? <laughs> Not good at running. You could Pierce is great at running. Yes. He was great. He made it look so easy. You know, I thought we had to run after a moving plane. And I thought, oh, Pierce is doing it in rehearsal. Looks great. It's easy. Sure, I can do that. Get out there. I swear I saw smoke coming out of his shoes. <laughs> I thought I was like a gerbil, running, 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 and the plane and Pierce just left me in the dust. So, next time, I'll practice my running. Uh, next time? Do you, do you, would you like to do another one? I mean, there have been certain Bond ladies who have been in more than one movie. Um, I would love to. I, I wasn't implying that I would necessarily be back. I, I haven't been asked, but <laughs> the next time I have to do any running, <laughs> I will prepare. <laughs> and Jinx, the character that you play, very feisty lady. I mean, mm -hmm. on, a, on an equal terms, almost with James Bond, in terms of looking after herself. Um, is that a, a character that you might take into another movie, into another sphere? I have no idea. No? It's been suggested, that's all. 
Yeah, I would love to. I, I loved playing Jinx, and I love that she could be that empowered and that she could essentially have the same job as James Bond. She could be a trained spy slash assassin for her country, just as he is for Britain. So you had a good time making it, huh? I had a wonderful time, yes. Great. I did. Well, nice to uh, meet up with you again. So, Honey Berry, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs> James Bond is a contemporary hero for a contemporary audience, some of whose parents weren't born when 007 first took to the screen. We get older, but he never does, and his appeal crosses the generations and it moves with the times. <laughs> You might know Tom Cruise or you might know Harrison Ford, but there are parts of the world where they don't count for so much. But there is no part of the world where James Bond doesn't count. I mean, there are so many films out there that have special effects and, and action and, and all the things that James Bond has, but, but what James Bond has that they don't have are these characters that people have known for, for 40 years. Harry Saltzman always used to say, when people come out of a Bond movie, the women are remembering Bond, and the men are walking tall. You look at Sean's, you look at Timothy's, you look at Roger's, you look at George's, you look at Pierce's, and they're different, but it, nonetheless, it's still the same character. I think the major thing that, that, the, that the, the, the Bond people managed to pull off is that it is, even though it is this massive, massive organization, it's very much a family. And Barbara Broccoli and, 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 and Michael Wilson are just two of the, the nicest people you could ever hope to meet. Bond is, without doubt, it's the longest anyway, but it's also the most successful and the most wished after. You know, I've, I've got a house in LA and uh, I work over there quite a lot with American stuntmen, and they all say, oh, I'd give my right hand to, to come and work on a Bond film and do it for free. This, the fan base in Britain is just unbelievable. They, they, they come out for this movie like no other, and I guess. It is a much beloved British genre, you know, everything else has gone, Carry On, Movies, David Lean, everything else has come and gone, and, uh, and this thing's still going on. One of the great keys to the success of the series is that it has spanned four generations and, and isn't a kind of dinosaur, you know, it's, it has to appeal to a modern audience, and imperceptibly it's grown up. Now, now you want to keep him in, uh, in a modern environment uh, as much as possible. Uh, but still, MI6 is MI6, and he has a boss, and he does all these things, and he has the latest gadgets. So you keep him up to date by virtue of the, the political and social environment that he finds himself in. How much can you go into Bond's character as a human being? Um, I think Pierce has probably pushed that a little more and needed to do so in order to keep the whole thing fresh. Pierce is also a very witty actor. He's very humorous. I never forget one moment when, in the opening sequence, you know, he goes underground, under the water with the boat. He did it, and then as he comes underwater, he just straightens his tie, which was just a, a brilliant touch. The same person who set me up then has just set me up again to get Zhao out, so I'm going after him. The only place you're going is our evaluation center in the Falklands. Double O status rescinded. Along with my freedom? For as long as I deem necessary, yes. You're no use to anyone now. Welcome, please, the present James Bond, 007 number five, Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> so, how do you keep it fresh? You're the how do you keep it fresh? Yeah, That's a great Bond. question. Where do you begin? Well, you start with someone like Lee Tamahori. Uh, Lee brought a great energy to the piece and a uh, great focus and intention. And, you know, they're very difficult to uh, repeat over and over again and to, to stay in focus with. Um, but I think with Martin Campbell, Martin Campbell 
realized, and Barbara Broccoli realized, and Michael realized, Michael Wilson, that it had to really kind of take a leap. Take the leap with the character? The character, the character kind of, you have to play the reality. And it's very difficult to make it your own. As you say, Sean cast a large uh, shadow over this role. And I grew up with him and uh, watching him. And it, you have to play it with supreme competence. And uh, you steal a little bit from Sean, a little bit from Roger. <laughs> and then you go to the text and you see what uh, Fleming puts down. It's not a lot, is it? It's not very helpful. No, no, it's a very kind of thumbnail outline, mm. really. When you sat there watching the Bond movies when you were a kid, when you saw Sean for the first time, did you ever imagine in the whole world that one day you'd become that person? Oh, God, no, not really. I mean, I saw, I saw Goldfinger in 1964. I was a lad. I was just off the plane from, from Ireland and then Putney High Street one summer's day saw this film. But actually, Roger, you know, had a great influence as well when he did The Saint. By the way, uh, the love scenes with, with Halle Berry, uh, did you enjoy them? I enjoyed them enormously, yes. Yeah. I mean, how could I not? Well, more precisely, it's a daft question, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit yes, <laughs> but, uh, and they weren't that hard to do. They were that hard to do. How do they change with the times, though? You do, do, I mean, is Bond going to have to take a leap there? I mean, they're fairly strong stuff compared to the other Bonds, aren't they? The Bond remains the same, really. It's the world around him that changes. Mm. Uh, you know, he's a man you have to play with elegance and charm and style, and there's a physicality to it. And there's also this kind of enigmatic quality to the fellow. What about playing him for the fifth time? Is that on the cards? Well, they've, uh, they've invited me back, and I've said yes, so uh, it looks like there'll be a fifth. And might there be a sixth after that? I don't know, Michael. I have no idea. I cannot tell the future that far. But uh, I've had the time of my life playing him. You know, Good. It's been, uh, been a great time. Yeah. Mm. Well, we've enjoyed watching you and well, continue to do so. Pierce Brosnan, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Shirley Bassey still brings shivers to the spine when she sings. Now, tomorrow night, BBC Two's on an epic expedition to plumb the secrets of the Arctic. Operation Iceberg begins at nine o'clock. Thank <laughs> you.